Okay. Our presentation today is on confined space air monitoring. Um, we kind of broke this up into multiple sections um, because there's a lot to there's a lot to cover, and we also wanted you to have a, a uh, webinar recording that you could go to if you ever had a question on one of these subjects. And so we kind of covered the over overview of confined space this last time, um, and we'll be uh, and, and we'll be taking different pieces of this, whether on our YouTube channel or others. Um, Doug and Brent, if you could, could you help Julio out? Looks like he's got no uh, no sound coming through. Send him an email on that. Um, confined spaces. Last month we talked about confined spaces and and just how dangerous they are. This is one of the most dangerous things. Um, many of our people that we work with confined in public works or other other areas. One of the most dangerous things that they will do um, ever in their in working. And we don't want you to do like this guy and just dive in. We want you to do this correctly um, and keep yourself safe when it comes to when it comes to uh, confined space entry. So I'll do just a couple of review slides um, to review what a confined space is. And here's the definition. This comes from OSHA. It's a space that's large enough to enter and do work. It has limited means of entry and egress. It means it's hard to get in and out of. I have to go through a manhole or a manway or a climb a ladder or something like that. It's not, I can't, I can't just open a door and walk in. It uh, is not designed for continuous employee occupancy. It's not, it's not a place that we're, it's not an office or anything like that. So examples of a confined space would be uh, manholes, vaults, pits, um, sometimes attics, um, air handlers, a whole variety of different things can be confined spaces. Under the OSHA permit required confined space standard, they define a permit required space as one that has a hazard in it. And, and they specifically design what, or define what the hazards are. One of those is what we're gonna talk about today. It, has, it contains or has the potential to contain a hazardous atmosphere. It contains a material that has the potential for engulfing an entrance, something like water, sewage, um, aggregate inside of a, inside of a uh, cement truck, um, various things like that that could engulf us if we were inside of that confined space. As an internal configuration that could trap or asphyxiate an entrance, um, tight spaces, something that converges down to a, to a tight space and it could pinch us, um, or contains any other recognized serious safety or health hazards, live electrical, um, serious fall hazards, something like that. All of those, um, all of those um, are hazards that can make a, a confined space a permit required confined space. And when it becomes permit required, there's a lot of extra work that we have to do for that. And we talked about that in last month's video that you can, or webinar recording that you can go back and review on our website. Um, but today we want to talk about, we want to talk about um, air monitoring and those hazardous atmospheres that are number one on those ha uh, on the list of hazards because that's the number one cause of death in a confined space. Okay. So let's dive right into um, air monitoring and what we're really dealing with. First thing, it's important to understand that anything can be a poison in, in sufficient dose. Drinking too much water can kill me. If, I, if I'm not exp um, expelling that water quickly enough and I just keep drinking, I can actually die from drinking too much water. Well, the same thing goes with gases when I'm in a confined space. And the problem with confined space is it's so tight in there and it may not have good ventilation that we can easily increase the, the concentration of a bad thing or we can consume the oxygen that we all rely on to live. So, <clears throat> so Inside of a confined space, some of these things that on a normal average day, we wouldn't even worry about when I'm walking around in the office or outside, but when I'm down in that confined space, it can be lethal. Let's talk about just briefly how chemicals can get into our bodies, the routes of entry. We have really four of these, injection, absorption, ingestion, and inhalation. Now those first three that I mentioned were, um, are, are really important, but when we start talking about gases, the inhalation route is really the primary route and it's the one that we want to be most concerned about because if I breathe a gas into my lungs, 
it gets to my bloodstream and then it can go anywhere in my body. That's where I can have the quickest and, and the most significant effects is through the inhalation route because it gets right to you. Um, and so these gases are, are, are definitely things we need to be concerned about. We well, you ask yourself and you say, well, how much is too much of a given gas? I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a toxicologist. I don't, I don't know all of these things. Well, but we have some really easy, simple guides that can help us on that. And they're called exposure limits. Some of these are legal limits. Some of them are, are guidance limits. Um, and, uh, and they give us an idea of how much is too much. First one on the list is the permissible exposure limit. This is OSHA's number. This is the number that, um, that your employer can expose you to of a given chemical eight hours a day, 40 hours, 40 hours a week for a working lifetime. And, and not get a citation, not get a fine from OSHA for this. Well, these numbers are not always the best because they're really a political thing. They're something that's been set by the government and sometimes there are industry, industry groups um, that uh, are lobbying against changing, lowering these numbers, even though, even though the science may say that it, it's important to lower that. Um, so it's good to know what the PEL is but it's not necessarily the best when it comes to your health. The best number would be the threshold limit value or TLV. And this is, this is a group of really smart folks that get together and they take all of the data. These are, these are from studies to actual incidents that happen where people are overexposed to, to a certain gas and they set a threshold limit value for that. I would always base my um, my own health on the threshold limit value. If I'm, if I'm looking at a certain chemical that I'm going to be exposed to, that's what I want to know about. Also on here, we have ceiling limits for certain chemicals. Um, there, there have been established a ceiling limit that says you can't go over this at any time um, because it's, it's so hazardous. An example of that would be chlorine gas, which many of you, many of you might use in your different operations, either in water, or sewer, various different operations, chlorine gas is, is really an important thing, but it's highly toxic. So at a level of one part per million, uh, chlorine gas can be, it can be deleterious to your health. It can hurt you. Um, and you say, what's a part per million? Well, part per million is just kind of what it sounds like. If I take a million of something um, and, uh, and I take one of those million and I make it something else. Let's take, a, let's take um, Coca-Cola. I have a, a 999,999 um, cans of Coca-Cola and I put one can of Pepsi in that entire stack. That's one part per million. That is the concentration at which chlorine will hurt you. So it's really a small concentration. And it's, you know, when we start talking a 1% con concentration, that's 10,000 parts per million. That's really actually quite a bit. So, uh, so when we're looking at these, they're small numbers. And, uh, and they're things that we really have to get our, get our mind around because it's, it can be lethal to us or can be bad for our health. All right. Um, with air monitoring, air monitoring is essential for a safe entry in confined space. This is something that is, um, is blown off frequently in confined space entries. And this is probably the one thing, if you, if you were to only do one thing in your confined space entry procedures to save your life, this would probably be it, along with, along with ventilating the space, because this is the number one cause of people dying in confined space or these hazardous atmospheres. So as we, as we started thinking that we're going to do air monitoring, we need to know a number of things. Why are we doing it? Well, we want to identify these gases that are out there, many of which are odorless, colorless, tasteless. You don't know that they're there. Carbon monoxide is absolutely um, those. You can't tell it's there until you've been until you've been overexposed and, and you start going to sleep or you have a or you have a raging headache or whatever. It can get you before you even know it's there. That's why these, uh, these gas detection instruments are so important. Um, when do we do it? Well, we do it every time we are, every time we are entering a confined space. So this, this is essential to have your attendant 
checking that and not only not only when you go in but continuously throughout the throughout the uh, uh, entry into the confined space that a tenant should be paying attention to that now we may document that every 15 minutes to write down what it is but we should be continuously monitoring um, who is going to who is going to do it well of course the attendant uh, who is monitoring the entry outside the confined space will will be monitoring that but the entrance as well can do that our meters have gotten have gotten really simple um, they're small they're they're really easy to use and the price has got has come down significantly as technology has gotten a lot better so i can i can simply take a meter like this bump test it make sure it's working right hook it onto my pocket you can't see it from my camera here um, but just snap that in place and i can wear that all through my shift and be able to and be able to continuously monitor that and if and if there's a problem with the air around me it's going to let me know right now okay um, how do we do it well this can be this can be a topic of that can be confusing at times how do how do we do this appropriately um, and that's really what we're going to talk about today but don't ever be afraid to ask questions when it comes to it comes to this or any other subject in in confined space or any any subject around safety we're always ha happy to walk you through and and help you to to come up with solutions for this and we might say hmm i'm not sure let's take a closer look and let's let's figure out how how it's best and we're happy to do that all right we also want to look at the details um what do those numbers mean just because your alarm on your meter isn't going off that doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're totally out of the woods we could be skirting close to that and and maybe see something coming ahead of time if we know what those numbers are but you've got to you've got to to know what you're looking at okay so <clears throat> before we start before we do our testing we need to know what our equipment is there are literally dozens if not hundreds of different meters that you can get out there and really all of them meet various standards there some are better than others and generally you pay you pay you get what you pay for um, you may pay a little bit more for reliability um, but most of these will be, be really good in confined space uh, in confined spaces we use what we call a four gas meter um, and we'll talk about what those four gases are but it gives us an idea of the general conditions of that of that space. So there's some basics to it. These are electrochemical sensors. Um, they're good. They're far better than what we've had in the past. They're far cheaper than what we've had. They're not perfect. Um, this will not tell you everything about your confined space. It'll only give you those four gases. If there's something else in there, chlorine, for example, I may have to get a separate meter um, for, for that. These things are <clears throat> These things have their limitations. They have to be calibrated. They have to, they have to be tested to make sure they're working right. They have batteries. When I pulled this one out this morning, the batteries were dead. Had to go, had to go get some new batteries. Now they have rechargeables or you can, or you can use just, uh, just double A batteries in these things, but, but they do have those limitations. Um, but this is your lifeline. This is the thing that can save your life. You gotta make sure that you have it and that it's working appropriately. Go to the next session. Next section, like I said, this is your lifeline. This is the thing that can that can determine whether you go home alive tonight or not. So, how do you know that it's working right? Well, the way that I test the way that I test this every time, which is a requirement, is I need to do what we call a bump test. What the heck is a bump test? Well, a bump test simply I take a cylinder of a calibration gas and it has the gases that I'm worried about in known quantities um, scientifically measured quantities so I look on here it says carbon monoxide 100 parts per million hydrogen sulfide 25 parts per million methane 2.5 percent by volume or 50 percent of the lower explosive limit oxygen at 17 percent concentration and there's nitrogen that makes up the balance of it okay we know exactly what the gases are inside of this cylinder. So if I take this and I have a, have a valve on here, 
I hook it up to a means to expose my meter. It's just a hose, cylinder, I hook the hose on here. And here's the means, and I turn that valve on. I won't do it because it stinks right now. <laughs> um, it's hydrogen sulfide, by the way. I take my meter and I put it into, this is a pump that puts the puts the gas on it and I pop it into here. I'm not going to put it all the way in because it's kind of noisy when I do. Um, but I pop it into there and I allow it to I allow it to cycle um, for at least 30 seconds. But each each meter might have a different time frame that they want you to, to allow it to be exposed. But I read what it says on the meter. And if it says exactly what it says on this cylinder, then I passed my bump test and my meter will read accurately Then it will save my life. If it doesn't read right, then I need to calibrate the meter. Can you do calibrations yourself? The answer is yes. Um, you have an owner's manual with that. If you don't, if you can't find the owner's manual, they're really easy to get online or you can call the, the place that you bought it from or the manufacturer um, or go online. They, they have those available. It will walk you through. You can also send it in to the send it in to the manufacturer or to the the place that you bought it from, and they will do a calibration for you for for a charge. Um, and many of you are on a rotation where every six months you have your cal your meter go in for calibration. That's good. Most of the manufacturers require that that at least six months every six months it's calibrated. Um, I it depends on how often you're using it um, and. Uh, and what kind of abuse it goes through, how often it may need calibration. It might need to be calibrated multiple times during that six months just because it went off, it kind of drifted. Um, and we do our bump test and it isn't reading right. Well, don't, um, you know, when you look at this, if I, if I see that I'm a few percent off on, you know, a percent or so off on, on my oxygen concentration, I can't use this. I can't say, well, it's 1% off. Um, I'll just, I'll just correct for that. That's probably putting your life in jeopardy because we really don't know where, we really don't know what it's reading. We set a calibration, a fresh air calibration and a Calgrass calibration, and it makes a slope. And that's how it knows how to read. Okay, so uh, um, when I calibrate it, I, I do a fresh air calibration. What does that mean? I take it into an area of known clean air. And I go through, you push certain buttons on there, and, it, it, and uh, each meter will have a different sequence of buttons that you push. But you, uh, but you push uh, the one for fresh air calibration, and it will set a zero, er, a zero level. Basically says this is, um, this is zero. There's none of, the, none of the bad stuff in here and 20.9% uh, um, oxygen. And it's going to it's going to zero that out. Actually, it doesn't do it on the zero air. It doesn't do oxygen. That's on the on the cal um, test. But it sets zero. Okay. But one problem with this is if I do that fresh air calibration in dirty air, um, we are we're here at North Salt Lake at, at the trust. And if I walk out the front door, we have US 89 is right on our right on our front front step. And so there are a lot of cars going along here. Um, I-15 and 215 are just down, just down the hill from us, as well as a bunch of a bunch of petroleum refineries. The air outside of the trust is probably not as clean as it is where you are. And so if I cal if I did a fresh air calibration on this today, and then I went to where you are, it would probably it, it would probably read a negative number. If you ever see a negative number on your meter. That means it was probably fresh air calibrated in dirty air. Um, so you want to do a new fresh air calibration on that and do that do that calibration. I would have somebody at your organization um, be the meter guru. Set somebody whose responsibility that is to, to um, ensure that the meters are working OK, replace sensors if they're needed, deal with the manufacturers and all of that. Um, and set somebody up to do that. But you can, any one of you out there can calibrate these meters. Um, it's just following the owner's manual and pushing buttons and applying the gas at the, the appropriate time. And it will do that. Now your sensors will live uh, for a certain amount of time and over time they, they start to go bad. Um, it's an electrochemical sensor and 
some of those some of those may only last a year before you have to replace. Um, so when you buy a meter, it is important to to look at the details on that. How long are the sensors guaranteed for? And that will help you have an idea of what you're going to have to spend on replacing the replacing the sensor. Some of these will guarantee their sensors for one years, two years, five years even uh, with some manufacturers. Um, you'll pay a little more for those for the longer sensors, but you, you want to look at what the cost is and, and how it works. Uh, many of you may be asking, how much does one of these meters cost? Um, what is the what is the price range that they'll have to be looking at um, for replacing that old one? Or maybe you don't have one at this point. Um, they start in the five hundred dollar range <clears throat> and will go up over a thousand dollars depending on what bells and whistles you put on there. But for a basic four gas meter. You can probably get one for about $550 for a single gas meter. This is a carbon monoxide detector here. <clears throat> um, they're about $150 to $200. Um, but there will be some additional costs that you'll have to incur. Um, we, talked about, we talked about the calibration gas and, and uh, something to apply that gas. So there'd be a kit that would go along with it, as well as a pump. You want to have a pump. Some some of the meters will come with a built-in pump. Some will come with an external. I personally like an external because they seem to be more reliable that way than if the pump is built into the meter. But that's totally up to you. Um, if you buy all this stuff as a kit, um, you'll probably be in the fifteen hundred dollar range, maybe a little less than that. Um, but that will get you a good setup and and uh, and get you started on that. Okay, we need to know what our levels are, and we need to realize, and I've said this before, this four gas meter is only good for those four gases. It, it's not going to tell me if there's chlorine there. It's not going to tell me if there's, if there's something else that these, don't, that these don't meet. And so I need to understand my space a little better. <clears throat> All right, so testing some basics here. We want to test your space the right way. Understand the, the dynamics of, of your space. A sewer manhole is very different than a than a cooling tower or air handler, and how we go about testing it and entering that space are very different. So we need to know what the hazards are. A sewer manhole is almost always going to have some methane and some hydrogen sulfide in it. It's just the nature of a sewer manhole. A a pressure relief valve um, vault has a potential to have low oxygen, um, but don't ever be surprised if something if something pops up because crazy things can happen. Sometimes there's a spill, and uh, and there's a chemical that shows up into a confined space. Looking at your space, how it's configured, a vertical space is very different than a horizontal entry space. So on a vertical space, I might use my pump. Like I'm rolling off my desk. I might use my pump. <clears throat> Um, to test different levels. So I have a hose on it. I put it out into the space. I would, I would always check if you have the option to check your space prior to opening it up, I would do that. So say you have a, a sewer manhole that you're going to going to enter and there's a hole in the lid or I can just pry that lid open a little bit. I would put the hose down in there and test that space prior to ever opening it. Some some are sealed and we don't have a whole lot of option on doing that. <clears throat> um, but test the space before you, before you open it if you can. Um, I'm going to drop that hose down in at various different, different levels. Well, in a horizontal space, that's a lot more difficult, right? Because it's going that way. And this hose, I can't just hang it out in the air. So I might have to come up with a probe or a wand, a way to, a way to test at various different uh, locations inside the space. If I only test at the opening, that's not going to give me an accurate reading as to what what gases I will see when my people are down in the space or up in the space or whatever, whatever it may be. <clears throat> so I want to look at different um, at, at different levels in the space because the densities of, of gases vary. So something like methane in a, in a sewer manhole is lighter than air. It will be up to the top of the space. So when you go in and you, and you make a spark, you could, you could flame over. 
something like hydrogen sulfide, which is really toxic, is heavier than air, and it's going to be at the bottom of the space. So if I climb down that ladder and everything's good until I get down to the last six feet, and I and I breathe in that uh, that hydrogen sulfide, I could be overcome without even knowing it's there unless I'm doing this testing. Um, the size, the configuration, length, um, the ventilation that's in that's involved with this space, these are all important considerations in how I how I go about testing and ventilating the space. Um, so we talked about pumps. Um, this, uh, in this picture, you can see there's a pump attached to a meter, but it also has, it has a, a probe. That makes it a little bit easier to test some of those spaces. On that probe, it has a back um, backflow, or not a backflow, a uh, water prevention valve on it. Uh, if I drop this down into a manhole and the hose happens to get into a um, get into some liquid there. We don't want that getting to our meter, so so they'll have a have a uh, a little stop in there, so if water comes up into the system. Um, so just reminder that reminder that air becomes stratified, and uh, the stuff at the top of the space may be great. The stuff at the bottom might kill you. How many different levels do I need to test? It depends on on the size and and complexity of the space. If it's a really deep uh, manhole that I'm going into, I might be testing a dozen different levels. Um, just a reminder on that, you have to give your pump and your meter enough time to react. As, uh, as this pump is drawing air up through, it takes a certain amount of time for that air to go up through the tubing and into the pump and then onto the sensors of the meter. And it takes some time for your sensors to react. And each different each different meter will have will have a specified time. Um, I would always look at least 30 seconds before I move on to the to the next space to give a, 30 seconds after the gas has gotten to my sensors um, for that meter to really react. All right. Um, you want to know what your what your meter is telling you, and we'll talk about what the numbers mean. But there are also alarms on there, and a lot of people, a lot of people, deal with or think that, well, if the alarm isn't going off, I'm safe. Well, that's kind of short-sighted. You're not seeing the whole picture. So there are some alarms. Uh, oh, and just on, on that same subject, some people will say, well, I don't have a pump, so I just tie a rope onto my meter and drop it down into the into the manhole, and if the alarm doesn't go off, I'm good. Well, that you could be very close to an unsafe atmosphere. And it's just not quite to where the meter's going to go off. And when you get down there, um, you, you put yourself into a bad situation. So it's always important to know what those numbers are and, and to be able to document those. OK, so just a, a couple of things on alarms. There's, there's generally a high, a high alarm and a low alarm. Um, and in most cases, that high alarm will be what they call latching. That means that it stays on even though the, the concentration goes down below that limit. And you have to acknowledge it. You have to push a button on that alarm that says, OK, I understand that, it's, that it um, and, uh, take an action to, to get out of there. You need to know what those levels are at. And we'll talk about those in just a second. Um, there's some options in here the, uh, that different manufacturers may have. Some have recently put in what we call a man down alarm or pass in the fire world uh, pass system. It's it basically, if you stop moving, an alarm is going to start going off. Now it gives you, you know, like 30 seconds or whatever. If you, if you just stop to think about something, it's not going to go off right then. But if, if you um, don't move for, uh, for whatever the time duration is, that they've got it programmed it will start alarming. There will be a visual and audio alarm um, that tells others that you may have passed out. It, uh, it may be something that will help find your body if, if, there's a, uh, if there's a problem that way. You should be tied off, by the way, so we can find that. Um, data logging is also an option, so we can see what your exposures are during the time. And some new models have Bluetooth connectivity, so you can you, your attendant can read what various different responders inside of the space, not responders, entrance inside the space, um, what their meters are saying. So not only can, can the attendant read at the opening, 
but they but he or she can also see who um, who is exposed to what when they're down in the space that's pretty cool technology and you'll pay a little bit more for that but uh, i think it's well worth it um, hazardous as atmospheres can be created by natural decomposition of materials so as uh, as we flush the toilet and our wastes go down into the sewer system those wastes start to uh, start to decay and uh, and that produces various gases, hydrogen sulfide, methane, um, it can consume oxygen, all of these things happen. And then folks have to go out and go into those confined spaces to do whatever the tasks may be. Um, that puts them at risk. Sometimes we are our own worst, en worst enemy. We can uh, you know, start up a cutoff saw or a generator, or we've got our exhaust of our truck that's idling sitting right next to our ventilation fan and uh, and we dose ourselves with something bad. Um, sometimes there's an emergency or a spill or a leak that can put something into a confined space. So we want to watch for what we're um, what potentially could be in that space. All right, so let's talk about the gases that we're concerned about. Um, these first four are the four that your four gas meter um, will detect and read. And then there are others as well. So oxygen, flammable atmospheres, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen sulfide are those four gases that you'll have on your, on your confined space meter. We should always start with oxygen. Why is that? Well, oxygen is essential for life. Um, if you don't believe me, hold your breath for, for three minutes. And, uh, <laughs> and when you wake up, um, we'll talk about it again. Oxygen is really important um, for our ability to stay alive. So we want to check that first. In addition to that, the other meters, in particular, the, the combustible meter, <clears throat> need to have oxygen to function um, correctly. So we want to, uh, um, so we want to look at what the numbers are for oxygen. What should I be reading on my meter? Well, the normal concentration of oxygen in the air is 20.9%. Um, what's not enough oxygen? We probably all held our breath sometimes or hyperventilated and found out what, oh, I didn't get enough oxygen and, uh, and, I'm, and, and I feel like passing out, I get dizzy. Um, le anything less than 19.5% is oxygen deficient. Um, we do have one special number here called the IDLH or immediately dangerous to life, life and health concentration. And that's six, less than 16% for oxygen. If I'm below that, I'm either gonna die I'll be overcome or won't be able to get out of that space. So it's important to know that. So if you're, if you're low on oxygen, you may, um, you may, you know, feel a little giddy. You might feel tired. You might feel like things are moving slowly or you can't quite uh, wrap your mind around something. We don't ever want to get to that point. We want to know ahead of time if we have an oxygen deficient atmosphere. So use your meter, make sure it's calibrated and bump test. On the other end of oxygen, we have 23.5%. Um, Anything above that is what we call oxygen enriched. Um, oxygen is an oxidizer, um, and it will make things burn that don't normally burn, or make things, make things burn um, a lot hotter than they would otherwise. So if you're standing in a 100%, in or it, not, it doesn't even have to be 100%, just an oxygen enriched atmosphere, and you light a match, your clothes will probably burst into flames, and so will you. Um, so we want to look for that. Uh, anytime we're using a, a oxyacetylene torch or something that could enri enrich the oxygen concentration in a confined space, we have to be really careful and monitor that. Okay. Um, oh, and one thing, I, one thing I want to talk about on oxygen, make sure you calibrate um, the meter at the elevation that you're going to use the meter. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, in Utah, we have mountains around, and some some of you out there will be going from a low elevation up to a vault where you where you have your water collection facilities, and you want to do a confined space um, entry there. You take your meter up in elevation; it most likely will not read accurately because the pressure has changed. Your oxygen um, up at elevation will be the same. Um, concentration, the same percentage, uh, 20.9, as the other gases. There's just less of it. 
there's a lot less pressure up there, but realize that when you change elevation, that can mess up your calibration. And so you should definitely calibrate it and bump test it at the elevation that you're going to use it. Always measure oxygen first, stay between 19 and a half and 23 and a half. And remember that those sensors can go bad um, within a year. So we need to plan for that. Flammable atmospheres, burning to death is a really bad way to go. And so we wanna prevent that under all, all costs. And so to prevent that, we have to look at what makes a fire. To make a fire, we have to have oxygen, heat, and fuel. We have to have an ignition source and a fuel. Well, in, in measuring gases, we're looking at the fuel. How much fuel is there? And, uh, and we use a special measurement for that. It's called the lower explosive limit, LEL. And, and we read that in the percent of the LEL. And uh, what that means is how close am I to having enough fuel that if there's a spark, it will, it will ignite. Um, so 100% LEL means I've got enough fuel to have, that, to have that fire take place. Well, your meter will alarm at 10% of the lower explosive limit. Why do we have a 90% safety, safety factor when it, comes to, when it comes to LEL? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, what I said, burning to death, it's a really bad way to go. We want a safety factor there to get us out long before um, this place could burn. Um, concentrations change rapidly. And so if we spilled something that was flammable, that could, that could quickly fill up the room with a flammable concentration. So we wanna know ahead of time so we can get out. The other thing is, is our, this meter is only calibrated to, it, it's calibrated to methane, which is natural gas, the main component in natural gas. Um, and it works really well for that. And it will read other flammables but it's not going to be as accurate with gasoline or um, some other, some other uh, organic material that we spilled in there, um, lacquer thinner or um, xylene or something like that. It won't read exactly the same. So we give ourselves major safety factors there. So remember, 10% LEL, get your butt out of there. At 20%, you'll have a, sec a high alarm go off. You better be on your way out by the time you ever see that one. Carbon monoxide is a common toxin that, uh, that we'll see normally this time of year when it starts to get cold and people start cranking up their heating equipment. Um, and they have, this is when problems with that manifest a lot of times. It's a product of incomplete combustion. What happens with carbon monoxide is it gets into our, it gets into our bloodstream, into our hemoglobin, and it makes it so our, our blood can't uptake oxygen and get, and get oxygen to our tissues and it can kill us really quick. Um, so on these numbers, our permissible exposure limit is 50 parts per million. The TLV is 25 parts per million. The IDLH, immediately dangerous to life and health, is 300 parts per million. So it doesn't take that much of this stuff to get us into, get us into trouble. Your meter will alarm um, at 35 parts per million, and, uh, and it may have a secondary alarm at 50 parts per million. Um, but uh, you need to look at that on your individual meters. Some manufacturers do those a little bit differently. Um, hydrogen sulfide, this is, this is what we call rotten egg gas. And if you're ever around a petroleum refinery out in the, um, if you drive out in the basin where they have these oil fields, you will smell hydrogen sulfide there. If you pop the lid on a, on a sewer manhole, there will be hydrogen sulfide in there. You can smell hydrogen sulfide at low concentrations. You can't smell it at high concentrations. It turns your nose off. It, turn, it, causes, it causes what we call olfactory fatigue. And you can be exposed to really high concentrations and not have an idea that it's there. At high concentrations, this stuff can kill you in a matter of seconds. It can knock you down and, and kill you in very, in very short order. 100 part per million is the, is the IDLH concentration. It has a 20 part per million ceiling. Your meter will go off at 10 parts per million. And generally your secondary, level, secondary alarm will be at 15 parts per million. Um, <clears throat> this is nasty stuff and, uh, and, we, need to, and we need to know it's there. Um, other toxic, like I said, if you've got chlorine, you're, this four gas meter is not gonna tell you that it's there. We've gotta have an additional meter that will, that will help us to know what we're dealing with.
If you have a question on, on a different, different uh, material that's there, give me a call. I'm happy to run through that with you and, and, and ensure that you've got the appropriate um, air monitoring equipment for that. All right. Um, so just to review our, our limits, oxygen, we want to be between 19.5 and 23.5%. For lower explosive limit, you need to be below 10% of the lower explosive limit. Carbon monoxide below 25 parts per million. 35 is where your alarm goes off. 25 is the TLV. Um, your hydrogen sulfide below 10 parts per million. That's where your where your alarm will go off. Remember those numbers. So when you're when you're looking at that, you know what they mean. Um, just in summary, we want to we want to if I can stay on the right page. We want to know what your, what our spaces are. Um, understand what the hazards are. Test and ventilate your spaces. Um, Bump test every time before you use that. If it's not reading right, calibrate it. Know how to read, read your meters, know what those numbers mean. Um, in some situations, there can be interference. If your meter starts acting weird, get out of the space and, uh, and let's, let's check it and make sure that it's working right. And always don't be afraid to call me um, on that. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If you're just getting into this world and you don't know anything about it, um, maybe you haven't been doing it right give me a call. There's no judgment here. We just want you to be safe. We want you to go home alive every day and, uh, and not have these problems. Okay. I, uh, this is a safety, this is a safety moment. It went to moments today. Sorry, this is just a, a longer subject and, but I think it's important to have out there. Um, if you got any questions, please type those into the chat box or the Q and a box. And I will answer those in about, in about 30 seconds. Cause we need to, we need to sign off and uh, and get back ready for Brent's webinar that will start in just a few minutes. Um, and just on that, if you haven't um, if you haven't signed up for that webinar, send me an email right now to Jason at utahtrust.gov, and I will send you a link to to be able to get into that if you want to attend. Doug and Brent, anything I missed? No, that was, a, that was a pretty comprehensive for the subject, Jason. Good job. I don't see any questions. Do you see any questions? I can't see any. Right. Well, we will wrap up this session. If you have questions, folks, please don't hesitate to, to contact myself or Doug or Brent. Uh, we want to help you out. And uh, we want everybody to go home safe at the, at the end of the day. Um, be safe out there. Have a great day.